Well, welcome, Whiskey Bar uh, patrons, I guess you could say. Uh, it's good to be here. Thank you for showing up on this unexpected little announcement. We haven't had this in a couple of weeks. I've been traveling, doing this and that. So this is a little bit, uh, uh, this, it's nice to be back in any case. So what I want to say is that if you have any questions during the, the event itself, I want you to feel free to ask them because um, at some point I'll stop talking and then it would be nice to have sort of questions already ready. Uh, uh, Doug French is here, he's going to be helping me out. So you can just ask your questions as we go along and then he can chronicle them and toss them my way. So today we're talking about uh, two subjects. One concerns the the egg, uh, the patent trolls, and the other concerns um, something in an article that just came out today about uh, black market gas dealing in New York during Hurricane Sandy. So what's the connection between the two? Both of them are about uh, government regulations and restrictions on what people can buy and sell and do with their own property, and both of them are about uh, breaking bad. Uh, essentially going outside the law in order to achieve one's ends. So there's a relationship there. The, the, the patent case question comes from um, a decision last week that, that uh, favored um, a software company, uh, a very closely watched uh, decision. It's the Newegg software uh, company um, had challenged a patent troll and won the case actually in the second second round and it's great because it's it's the first time that the patent trolls have really been beaten back in this way up to now uh, this uh, patent troll named Sovereign was suing everybody in sight and for like the last 10 years have extracted hundreds of millions of dollars in, in uh, ongoing revenue from so many companies like you can't believe it like uh, J. Crew and JCPenney and Nordstrom's and even Amazon it's it's uh, an extortion racket of the highest caliber. Uh, just to be clear on what a patent troll is, so a patent troll is not really in business to do anything other than sue people. So a patent troll acquires certain patents on the open market. Uh, it may have chanced, changed hands two, three times in, in this case of this one company. Um, it had this uh, shopping cart software patent, if you can believe it. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but you know, just because you get a patent doesn't actually mean that it's valid. It still has to be validated by the court, so that's one of the reasons for these challenges. You can get patents for all sorts of screwy things. 98%, 99% of all patents are never used for anything. Well, the patent trolls go out shopping. They buy uh, silly patents from people. They collect them, and then they start suing. So this one company just had a you know, handful of employees. They weren't actually doing anything. They weren't um, making stuff or anything, they were just suing people. They were sending checks, they were sending notifications out, oh, it looks like you are trampling on, infringing our patent. So we want, we don't want to shut you down. On the contrary, we want you to thrive and use our technology and enjoy its use and get enormously wealthy and then give us one or two percent um, of your revenue. So it's a, it's really an extortion racket uh, worthy of, how should I say, well, worthy of uh, organized crime, really. I mean, so the goal here is not is not to shut anybody down. It's just, as I said in Godfather, Godfather Two, the the Don who preceded Don Corleone, he, he said, "I just want to wet my beak a little bit. You know, just give me a little bit of the revenue stream, and everybody's happy." So they were able to get away with this. Um, uh, Stefan Molyneux who pointed out something very interesting about these cases: the large companies don't entirely mind them because they know that in paying off the patent trolls and reinforcing the sense that they have power, they're able to kind of squeeze their, their, uh, lower their smaller competitors because if smaller competitors are not as able to pay as a large, larger well-heeled corporations are able to pay. That's why all the large corporations are happy to cough up. Well, Newegg said no more of this and challenged them in court. The first time they lost, but didn't get anywhere near the damages they expected. The second time they came back and the judge said, hey, you're right, this is a, this is a bogus patent. So they invalidated the patent. Uh, people who don't understand the way patents work are confused by a number of aspects of this case. One is that the idea that, that a patent isn't automatically valid uh, just because it's been issued. Uh, it's just a, a sheet of paper to hang on your wall unless it's actually been challenged in court. And if it's been challenged in court, there's a good, there's a good chance that it's going to fail because there's so many contradictory, uh, mutually exclusive patents. I mean, a good, good attorney can write 
write up a, a great patent application that's going to sort through the sales through the process. That's what they're good at. Uh, whether or not it's going to stand up under challenge is another issue entirely. Uh, another thing that's kind of interesting about this, lots of people debate this question of patents without knowing anything about the reality about the way the world works. I mean, so this one company that's patent trolled that owned these patents, uh, it's not as if they were somehow founded by the inventor of the shopping cart. You know, uh, the inventor of the shopping cart, you know, ancient history, long gone, nobody knows who he is and nobody cares. The, uh, the patent is just a patent number and it's traded on the open market, especially these days with the patent bubble, the way it's been developing, it's traded on the market like, like mortgage-backed securities or something. You know, the, the person who re originally extended the loan to the homeowner uh, it's just ancient history. It's moves and moves and moves. It's rebundles, repacks. technology, whatever. We live in a digital age. Everything's an experiment. Life is beta. Li life is alpha, actually. Um, it's good. We like it that way. You don't want to live in a stable world. In a stable world, everything is, everybody's getting poor. Everything's getting worse. There's no such thing as, as prospering uh, dynamic stability. That doesn't exist. You've got stability. It's antique. It's old. It's irrelevant to you and me. What we want to do is live in a world of um, instability, where things are flaky and don't always come together as they should. That means there's development and, and uh, evolution, civilizational advance. Anyway, so seek out instability, and there you will find prosperity and progress. Anyway, so that's just my little uh, miniature homily for the day. In any case, back to the patent case. So it has nothing to do with the creators. You know, so nobody's going to be inspired to go, oh my god, look at those people making all that money from patents. I think I'll invent something. I mean, it's not the way it works in real life. Um, the other thing that's interesting about the patent trolls, and again, this is this is a point Stefan Kinsella made to me, <laughs> something very, because everybody's down on patent trolls in a big way. I mean, you can read articles I think the New York Times had a huge attack on patent trolls. In a way, the patent trolls are not as, as bad as official, uh, normal, uh, legitimate, uh, mainstream patent-holding enforcers because the patent troll doesn't try to shut you down. You know, unlike, say, what Apple did to Samsung. You know, Apple, Apple is trying to shut down uh, your, you take your phone away from you, you know? It's not just that they wanted a revenue stream. A lot of times patents, patent holders will sue um, in hopes of being purchased. That's another way. That's not really patent, tro patent trolling. That's just trying to squeeze people to buy your stuff. But in a way, the patent trolls are kind of the, the least bad of all the patent holders because um, at least they, don't wanna, they just want to tax you. They don't want to uh, kill you. So... In any case, the New, Egg, the New Egg case was being very closely watched in the industry because it represents the first sort of break in the psychology um, that the, the patent holder always wins. And we could, uh, and you, I've, I watched it in preparation for the piece that came out on Saturday, which you're welcome to look at. I looked at a lot of charts about patent awards and patent payouts and all that. I mean, it's just been insane over the last 10 years. I mean, it looks like the housing bubble. That's how extreme it is. So I think there's something to this idea that this case may have, well, certainly destroyed the patent troll company, but it might have really seriously harmed patents. And it's part of, or at least, the ability of patent holders to extract unlimited uh, amounts of money from um, possible buyers with a inelastic demand for that product. I mean, it may have changed everything. We'll see. But in any case, whether this case did it or not, what we're looking at here in the long term is essentially the death of intellectual property. There's no way it can survive. Uh, it's just a matter of time. There's going to be a lot of ups and downs in the meantime, but look, um, more and more people are realizing that the whole key to our prosperity that we have today is due to the invention of the digital world, where things leave the realm of scarcity and enter into this uh, wonderland of, of infinite abundance. What is the internet but a, a giant copy machine? Copy, 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 unto infinity. Every copy can be changed. Every instance of anything being copied can last forever and does last forever. Um, this is a beautiful world. Now, when I was on um, Adam Kokesh's show, I think it was Sunday night, 
with Stefan Molyneux, which was very exciting to me. Um, we had a kind of, and, and then um, Adam Kokesh's good friend who was there, I apologize because I don't, his name just doesn't immediately stand out to me, but very articulate uh, defender of, of intellectual property in the realm of hardware and software. Um, but it took me a long time to come, because I got on to talk about this patent case, and it took me a long time to realize that we didn't all entirely agree on the terms of discussion, um, whether or not there is such a thing as intellectual property, how far it can reach, how does it differ from contract and trade secrets, uh, w uh, in what way is trademark related, um, is counterfeiting a form of fraud or not a violation of intellectual property, and, we saw, and there were so many things being discussed that it was an exciting, interesting discussion to me, but I also found myself a little bit frustrated just because I felt like we were having a hard time kind of defining our, ter our terms well. Not that defining terms is the key thing, but keeping our concepts uh, separated and clean. Um, and it wasn't really until the end that I felt like I needed to kind of make a, you know, a big statement about this. And um, I think the big statement I would make about this is that, um, is this. There is no such thing as intellectual property. Uh, the reason for that is that property is necessarily scarce. In order for the thing to be property, it's, there's, and by scarce I don't mean not too many of them. What I mean is uh, that it's uh, rivalrous. Like if I own it, you can't own it. That's what scarce means um, in an economic sense. It doesn't mean there's, there's, there's a shortage, uh, and the way to rectify a shortage is by creating a lot of them. Uh, that's not the point at all. Scarce really means um, non-reproducible. Um, non-replicable is another different way to do it. Because, I mean, you can see my shoes and reproduce a copy of my shoes if you have the right equipment, but it's not the same exact shoe. It's not an actual reproduction of it. It's not a copy. So, um, in a world without uh, exact copies, uh, you have a contest for resources, and those things end up being property. Uh, there's no, there's no property over something that is essentially non-scarce, that uh, is infinitely reproducible. You can call it your property. In fact, I don't particularly have a problem if people want to copy, uh, call something a property. Like I can whistle a tune. I say, well, that tune is my property. But as soon as I go out to the mall and start walking around and whistling that tune, other people can hear it and go, wow, that is an impressive song. And they can carry it with them. They can make a copy in their own minds and whistle the exact same tune. Those people can call it their property, too. Or they want. I mean, it's, it's fine if I want to call my, my sweet little song uh, my property, as long as I understand that um, I'm the full owner of my property and that every other human being in the world now and forever is also equally and to the same extent the full owner of that property. All right? I don't know if you buy that or not, but I'm just saying that in that sense, you can talk about intellectual property. I would rather just say property pertains to property and doesn't pertain to uh, the realm of infinitely reproducible uh, goods. The second thing I want to say about this, and this is something that occurred to me afterwards, you know, I think it's very important for us to begin to get some clarity about what digital economics really amounts to, what goes on in the digital world. What are people buying and selling? That's an interesting question because you can say, I downloaded that song from iTunes. You can say, I purchased that movie from Netflix. Um, I bought that digital book from Laissez Faire. But these are all just metaphors. You're not actually buying anything like a physical good. It's not the case that when you buy that song from iTunes, they have one less, iTunes, one less song to sell. They don't. They have an infinite number of the same song to sell. Um, so what you're actually purchasing, more precisely, in other words, this is all colloquial language. It's, inner, it's inaccurate. And I don't have a problem using it. It makes for good marketing and helps make sense of what we're doing in a way. But what you're actually doing is purchasing a service. The entire digital economy is a service economy, not a goods economy. And the service is the delivery of uh, the service that you want. That service consists of bringing a digital product to your into your possession. But you're not actually buying that digital product. What you're doing is buying the service. So when you buy from iTunes, you're buying a, purchasing a micro unit of the song delivery service. When you buy from Netflix, you're, you're, you're purchasing a micro unit of the movie delivery 
service from Netflix, and so on. It's a service economy, not a goods economy. And I think that's one of the reasons people get a little tangled up on this thing, because we, we talk about buying digital goods. In fact, I think I talk about buying, buying digital goods. It's not quite precisely right, because they, they're not really property, and they're not really uh, goods um, in that in the Mangarian sense of goods. Uh, what, what it is is a, a service that's been scarcified um, in order to make it profitable to make it available to you. That's it. That's the whole thing because, I mean, there's a lot of scarce goods still in the world, obviously, and so in order to put together that service, uh, that service requires a use of scarce resource and scarce resources and people uh, desire a commercial transaction in order to achieve uh, profitability. I mean, that's really all it comes down to. But they're not actually selling and buying uh, goods, unless, of course, you're on eBay. That's a different story altogether. I hope you understand the difference here. Okay. Um, oops, my computer shut off again. Okay. Now, um, so that's all the clarifications I want to make on that point. I encourage you to watch that show if you're interested. Uh, regardless, my point is that in a digital world is going to uh, it's going to make um, and has made uh, intellectual property impossible because uh, the digital world is a world of, of infinite reproducibility and infinite copying of everything. That's what the internet is. It's a giant copy machine. That's that's all it is. And uh, we could shut down the internet and preserve intellectual property as it used to exist. Or we can continue to keep the internet open. And if we want it to be something other than an old-fashioned 1970s style television, and some people do want that, uh, we're going to have to get rid of the idea of intellectual property. There's no, no saving it. We've had a 10-year war on piracy, and piracy is more prevalent than ever. And so is profitability in the digital economy. So these are not incompatible, which raises the last distinction I wanted to make that came up last night. Somehow there's an impression that that not using intellectual property is going to um, natu naturally lead to a sort of, uh, that there's not going to be any commerce involved at all. Now, this is ridiculous, or there's not going to be any profitability. It's like you have to choose one or the other, patent, copyright, or commerce and, and profitability. Um, that's not true. The whole of human history uh, shows us that's not true. Uh, there's been just a tiny slice of history in which we've had intellectual property um, at all, and a good part of history has seen a lot of commerce and a lot of profits. So anyway, I don't want to go into that any further. Now let's just turn over to this next topic, which is the source of my article today. And it was a... Uh, a fascinating link that I ran across from Peter Earle, who's a who's a kind of a New York Wall Street uh, you know trader, uh, who knows markets really well and was really seriously affected during uh, Hurricane Sandy. Now I have to tell you that in the couple of months before Hurricane Sandy, I wrote an article saying that that the next natural disaster, natural disaster that comes along, these price anti price gouging laws are going to have a terrible effect because if they go into place. It's going to create massive shortages for everything, particularly gas. And I had people tell me, well, that's pretty far flung. You know, that's just, surely anti-gouging laws aren't that big a deal. All they do is prevent uh, profiteering, uh, greedy people from getting rich during a crisis that's not going to cause any kind of calamity. Well, when Sa Sandy came along, the price gouging laws were, of course, immediately went to effect. What was cool about it, was that at least in the, according to the Peter Earl article that I that I discussed today uh, in my piece, it was widely ignored. And he he was what a great guy, right? I mean, he's like downloading all the price apps. He's got websites that he knew. He wouldn't even tell me what they were. At least he wouldn't tell me live what they were. But that had bid ask uh, pr pricing stuff on on gas in real time. Um, just uh, and he chronicled it like almost a. Every few minutes, you know, every change in the in the gas price, and uh, the complicated deals that were being struck, you know, like, well, I'll give you fifty gallons at you know at seven dollars a gallon, or I'll give you uh, three gallons at twenty five dollars a gallon, and all the rest of it. And he even documented the existence of um, the emergence of some small service to goods uh, bartering going on of 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 a sort that. Uh, 
I would describe in more detail, but it wouldn't be suitable for the uh, for the all ages. Um, and also documented uh, the existence of of of, of bed asks in in twenty dollar gold eagles. So that was especially interesting to me because I hadn't entirely realized that what happens in a in one of these emergencies is that you know, it becomes a very much of a cash-based economy. But what if you don't have cash at home? And how many people do have cash? I mean, do you carry, you know, a couple thousand dollars of cash, you know, at home just to use in, in a crisis? Maybe preppers do. I, you know, I don't know. But um, you can't get to a cash machine. Even if you went to the cash machine, the it might be down because the electricity is down. And even if you got to the cash machine and the electricity wasn't down, the cash machine would likely be empty and not restocked. So people were kind of desperate for just hand-to-hand -hand currency. Amazing, huh? So not surprisingly, precious metals uh, went into action and people were able to trade them and, and get stuff that they wanted. I thought that was pretty cool. Anyway, this is a wonderful report. Sort of real-time, real-world economics, courtesy of Peter Earle. And so I, I kind of put, put his long chronicle into prose. And then at the end of the article, I linked to a interview that I was able to do with him. And that was a fun interview. I mean, it only lasted about 15 minutes, but, you know, he's very articulate, knew his stuff. It was very exciting to interview. And so I, I linked that up there, put a down and dirty little video to go with the article, which I'm thinking I might do a little bit of more of that in the future because that was really that was really fun. Find an expert out there and do a quick interview and add a multimedia. Speaking of multimedia, I th I'm pretty sure that either today, late today, or maybe tomorrow, uh, Lose Fair's first multimedia book. Uh, I've got it over there. I should have I should have prepared to bring it out uh, for you and show it to you. But it's it's my book, um, A Beautiful Anarchy. And at the beginning, it's like it's, it's a digital book, right? And at the beginning of each section, there's a little video in which I'm discussing that. So before you read, you can kind of press play and hear me going on about this section. <laughs> it's the strangest thing. But the first example I saw in extreme alpha form was maybe three months ago, and I was just like struck silent in shock. So I think it was two days ago, it was on Sunday afternoon, when uh, Agora Financial sent me uh, Beautiful Anarchy in this format, and I downloaded it and opened it up, and I, that, it just amazes me. I mean, you, you understand what this means. Um, we're gonna start seeing a blending of, of text and video and audio all in the same digital format, you know, that will appear on our e-readers. I mean, this is, this is the difference between movies and books and, um, and audio recordings is not going to be, is going to blur further and further to the point that we have one, one, one package of, of, uh, digital experience all in, all, all in one unit. And, you know, purchasable um, through uh, delivery of, of uh, digital services. So that's what's coming. I'm really excited that Leslie Fair is on the cutting edge of this. It's the first we're going to try. I think we're going to try to release one every month. I hope I'm not misspeaking here, but I forget now. Everything's just crazy busy all the time. Okay, that's that's my main remarks. And okay, we've got the questions being delivered. This is great. Can you briefly discuss the difference between labor and toil, and how is there a difference between the two when it comes to uh, obtaining property rights? Labor and toil, you know, with this, uh, yeah. uh, Mises has some comments about this subject in Human Action, and uh, um, the other thing I would say about it, I mean, I, I've, I've always been, okay, I'm a little taken back by the question because I'm not really prepared to answer it, but um, Mises always describes labor as being uh, there being a disutility to, to labor, like you'd rather languish around doing nothing than laboring. I think that's an assumption in his, in his discussion of labor, which I never quite understood entirely because I'm not sure you can automatically say there's a, a disutility to it. But anyway, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that labor and toil have anything to do with property rights, really. Uh, I mean, uh, we don't establish property rights solely because as compensation for labor and toil, if that's what you mean. I'm not entirely sure 
what that means. You know, why do, why do property rights outside of the property rights in our body even exist? That's the interesting question. And I think the best answer to that was given in a book we're releasing on Friday. It's uh, Hans Hoppe's book, uh, Theory of Socialism and Capitalism, because he really deals with this um, from a theoretical point. The reason property exists at all is because of scarcity. If scarcity didn't exist, there would never be a need for property. Uh, Non-scarcity, a proxy for non-scarcity might be superabundance. Like if the only thing you ever wanted in life was a bananas, was bananas, then you lived uh, in a land of banana land where like you were just tripping over them everywhere and every tree was a banana tree and there was an infinite supply of bananas and that's all anybody wanted to eat and all bananas were homogeneous goods, you would not need to have property rights in bananas. So that's an example where of superabundance. And actually, evolutionary anthropologists say that actually this situation did, um, did, was pervasive, you know, something like a million years ago or something like that, where there was plenty uh, for our ancestors to eat, um, plenty for them to, there was no real shortage. Uh, there were plenty of slow-moving animals, so enough ostrich eggs around, enough insects to pick up off the ground <laughs> or, or whatever. Uh, to eat to sustain the human population, but that about 500 years ago, everything, there was a tragedy of the commons took place, uh, there wasn't enough to eat, so we established property rights in things in order to survive. So that's when we had to domesticate animals. Hey, that's my sheep, I'm going to breed these sheep and then I'll have a lot to eat. And that's when we started planting stuff and having to have property rights and land. So uh, that's an interesting thing because the evolutionary anthropologist story here exactly accords with Hoppe's own views and theory of socialism and capitalism. Now, I've read a lot of books on the history of property and property rights. I think Hans is, yeah, I can't say for sure he was the first one to solve this problem, but to my knowledge, this is the first book that really solved the problems. I mean, it's, it's a better theory than you'll find in, in Locke or any of the property rights uh, literature dating back even to the ancient world. So, we've got another question. What do you mean by patent bubble? Yeah, uh, so I would say there is a patent, um, yeah, uh, uh, there's a patent bubble. I mean, I mean, I think it exists because there's no real economic check on the prices of, of that people are going to be paying to pay off the patent trolls or to pay for price of pay for the patents because it's a fake market. I mean, this is a market not for real goods or real services at all. These are entirely legal creations. They're they're legal goods. They're invented by legislatures. They don't they don't really exist and they wouldn't exist in a world just pure um, contract or property. They just wouldn't exist. Because they always bind third parties. So they're legislatively created goods. They wouldn't exist in absence. So there's no check on the prices. There's not really a normal kind of supply and demand like you would get in a regular market. So it's not a real market. It's just people extracting um, huge fees from other, other people at the threat of coercion. So um, in other words, as long as the coercion is, is, is enforceable and people perceive that the courts are going to side always with the patent holder, then you've got a potentially you know, unlimited increase in the price of these patents, and the people will pay for, set, for patent settlements. Um, but as soon as that turns around, you could see the whole thing, uh, the prices just collapse. Not down to zero because the goods are still being created, but, but the outrageous sums and settlements that have been paid over the last I said 10 years, but it's probably more like five years. Uh, we might see an end to that. Again, I'll just say that the whole institution of intellectual property, whatever you and I think about it, it's going away. There's no way it can survive in this, in, in this world uh, anymore. I'm so impressed. I think that was the article that I wrote. Um, I think it was actually yesterday. I talked about the growth of international networks, global networks, and communications networks, and all the really cool tools on, online that allow you to kind of chronicle these and see where they're going and see them firing and what's going on. And it's mind-blowing because 
Now, the, 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 the world of digital networks is so much more wide and thick and complex and multi-layered and almost infinitely so as compared with regimes, governments, which are so geographically um, isolated and so attached to the physical world, which is rather useless in the scheme of things, uh, compared to the digital world. There's just no, there's no contest. There'll be plenty of victims along the way, but I expect the story of the next 10 years to be not just about the collapse of intellectual property. That's uh, an important point, but not, not decisive. I think we're going to see the flourishing of human liberty unlike anything we've seen since the 19th century, uh, uh, be precisely because the, because the digital world is being shaped and built by human volition in all of its infinite complexity and the fuel of this new world that's being built before our eyes is exchange of ideas which is the most important fuel that any economy could ever have that's it's the learning process the process that's embedded in these structures of communication that are going to give rise to unprecedented flourishing of of human liberty I think it's going to be very difficult for the government to stop this. Uh, no single government has enough power to do it. The resistance to the states and positions is growing. And this is combined with what seems to me uh, an all-around collapse of all the traditional tools that governments have used, from fiscal planning, which is just defunct at this point. I mean, it's preposterous. It's just straight-out robbery. Uh, monetary policy doesn't even work anymore. They've used the whole institutions of the central banks just to save the banking systems, banking system from itself. Um, no matter what area of life you look into, the public sector is getting increasingly decrepit, anachronistic, and unsustainable. And it's in the private sector that you're seeing the flourishing of human liberty, prosperity, the new ideas, the progress, the dynamism. And it doesn't take too many years for these things to overlap, intersect, and, and for one to just completely eat the other. Um, I'm giving a lecture in New Hampshire on the three stages of the anarchist revolution. And I'll go into more detail on that. I hope to see you at the Free State Project. I think it's February 22nd and 23rd. I'm giving the opening talk. Very flattered to be invited. Uh, where I'll be talking about this in, in more detail. I went over again. It's 1.34. Thanks for hanging in after the software cutout, and I hope to see you again next week. Mm -hmm.